This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, this is Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. Today, we're sitting down with David Mather, co-founder and president of MTPV, who explains his game-changing technology using semiconductors to capture waste heat. We'll then sit down with Todd Staples, commissioner of the Texas Department of Agriculture and chair of the Texas Bioenergy Policy Council. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to the Energy Maker Show. Today, we have David Mather, co-founder and president of MTPV. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I, I know you've had some exciting times and you've got some, some good news to report, but to, to set the stage for that, tell us about MTPV. Sure. It, maybe I can give you a little scenario to learn a little sure. bit about MTPV. So imagine if you could that there's an, a very plentiful supply of energy yep. uh, that's free and easy to access. And imagine that when you use it, you could make electricity less expensively uh, with no moving parts, more efficiently and create no emissions. Sounds like a good day. Sounds like a good day, right? Well, we believe that we actually can help the world bring a solution like that to the market. So we make semiconductor chips that convert heat directly to electricity. So much like a solar panel will convert light to electricity or visible light, uh, we can do that with any source of heat. Um, For example, waste heat. Waste heat is an enormous source of of energy that we have. Uh, Lawrence Livermore estimated last year we wasted 55% of all the energy we created. In the U.S. manufacturing segment alone, that's 3.3 trillion BTUs of waste heat. Wow. Right? If you converted that to electricity, it's $148 billion. Half of the electricity sold in 2007. All right, so explain to me how you do that. Well, so what we do is we take these chips, okay, we enclose them in panels, All right. uh, make arrays of these chips and panels, and we insert them into the area where there's waste heat. Right? And what happens is, uh, much like the sun emits photons uh, to a photovoltaic cell, so photovoltaic cell takes those photons and makes electricity. Right. What we do is we use an intermediary body. We heat up an, an intermediary body. And when you heat a body, it will also emit photons. And so if you have a body emitting photons and you put a photovoltaic cell with it, you can make electricity. Now, the world's been trying to do this for 40 years, right. but they were limited because not enough photons ever went from what this emitting device was to the photovoltaic cell. Um, and what we've discovered and patented and now proven in a building commercial devices with is that if you put those two devices very close together, about 100 nanometers away, that's 500 times smaller than a human hair, um, then the physics change and you get a tunneling effect of photons. So now you have an enormous amount of photons that will go from this emitting body to the photovoltaic cell, and you can make uh, electricity very efficiently, as high as 50 to 60 percent efficient on an order of magnitude 1 to 50 watts per square centimeter. So for the non-technical folks, the size of a postage stamp, a solar panel does about 0.02 watts per square centimeter, a flat solar panel. Wow. We could do 1 to 50 times that in the same area. Incredible. All yeah, right. So, yeah. so it, when you're looking to deploy this, do you envision this out at Dow Chemicals facility or out at some big industrial power plant? Uh, who, who's the customer? Yeah. So the first product is for high temperature waste heat. All right. uh, so think of large industrials, uh, glass plants. Got it. Uh, glass plants have 1400 degrees Celsius waste heat that leaves their furnace every day for 10 years straight going right up into the atmosphere. Cement plants, Uh, you know, smelting plants, uh, kilns, um, open and closed flares, um, thermal oxidizers, where uh, Dow Chemical has thermal oxidizers, BMW, as they're painting their cars, has thermal oxidizers. 
Um, the gas station down the street has a version of a thermal oxidizer or an open and closed flare. So anywhere we have high temperature waste heat, coal mines that are burning methane so the coal doesn't blow up, just burning it and wasting that fuel. So we could take all of that and make electricity. Well, it's a great story. Tell me about this new financing you just received. Yeah, so hot off the press. Uh, so we are in the midst of closing our Series B financing. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. We're real excited. It's, uh, it's you know, been a tough couple of years in the marketplace. Sure. Um, we closed about three quarters of it uh, yesterday um, and real excited uh, that we have a new strategic investor in that round. So we have many investors in that round, but more notably Applied Materials, um, who's the largest semiconductor manufacturer in the world. Uh, has decided to invest in the company. We're real excited to have them on, on board. Well, sure. Now, yeah. what, what was their rationale to get into this type of business? Yeah, so, you know, we're going to be making lots of chips, right? right? Uh, so arrays and arrays. Imagine, you know, many panels, 10, 20, 30 square meter panels in, a, in an exhaust flue at a plant. These are a lot of chips, yeah. and they're in the chip business. But more notably, you know, we're really taking what was traditionally a chip business and applying it to the energy world. So imagine taking what we know as chips today, CMOS chips or semiconductor chips, taking a semiconductor chip and placing that in the center of the energy world. That could be a market as big as the IT industry is today. <laughs> um, so there's, there's really great opportunity uh, for them. And, and they're really looking to get deeper and deeper into the energy world as the energy world continues to use more semiconductor materials. So as, as you look to commercialize, mm -hmm. I mean, there are all sorts of challenges, right, for any startup. Sure. What, what, what are some of the coming challenges that you're looking to surmount uh, as, as you seek to, to fully commercialize? Yeah, so, you know, one of them is just, you know, just longevity, right? Everything at this point in the energy world is new when we're doing these types of things. Right. And so some of the commercialization risk is, is you know, these things haven't run for 10 to 20 years because they're new. Yeah. You know, so it's really, it's really making the world comfortable almost with a new technology uh, and then perfecting the performance, right? We're building chips, but we're using them in very, very hot environments. So if you can imagine this hot chip, the, that's taking the heat is as, as hot as 1,200 degrees Celsius, yeah. a couple thousand degrees Fahrenheit, and virtually touching a chip that stays at room temperature. That's pretty difficult stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, so, but you know, but we're, we're beta testing today. Uh, the devices are working, so, um, so we're getting there. We're real excited. Now, tell me about the interest of the National Science Foundation in, in the company. Sure. So uh, we just uh, won a small grant uh, from the National Science Foundation uh, and with uh, one of our partners, uh, the UCLA uh, Nano Institute. Uh, and what we're doing is evaluating new materials for the photovoltaic side of our equation. Okay. So um, there's two things that we can do to make the system more efficient. One is you can make that gap between the two chips smaller. The smaller the gap, the more photons come across, the more electricity you make. The other thing is making the photovoltaic more efficient, which the whole world is trying to do in the solar world sure. as well. This, how do we make these chips more efficient? And by experimenting with new materials, new metals, uh, new 3.5 materials, um, we absolutely can make these devices much more efficient. But for us, it's also tuning it for working in these waste heat environments or other low temperature environments. The sun's very hot, 5,800 Kelvin, and silicon works very well as a receiver. Uh, in these lower band gap areas, lower temperature areas, you need better materials and more efficient materials. And so the National Science Foundation has given us a grant to experiment with some new 3.5 materials. And, and, and again, just uh, yeah. so the audience knows, the uh, yeah. 3.5 material? Yeah, so a 3.5 material has more, uh, more electrons available to it for, uh, to excite and turn into electricity. Okay. Uh, so they're tuned better for the band gaps that we'll be looking at. And also cost. Cost is a big issue, sure. right? Um, for real true adoption, if you want to just look at energy policy, for real true adoption to something alternative, right. the cost has to be there. Absolutely. Right? And so what we're not only experimenting is more efficient materials, but how you get to the cost levels of silicon. Silicon is a wonderful cost base. Uh, ma uh, materials like ingas or gallium intimidide, for those in the audience who know what these are, they're very expensive. So using those materials get you much better efficiency, but your cost model goes out the window. <laughs> so we're experimenting in National Science Foundation and NASA as well has given us a small grant uh, with, uh, as a subcontract with uh, Microlink to look at these new materials and how to process them more efficiently and more cost effectively. 
Well, David, you've been doing this a long time. <laughs> for, for the CEOs and the audience, uh, you know, one of the things that I've loved about you and, and our friendship is that you, you really know how to commercialize, yeah. right? You, yeah. know, you can take these concepts and drive them to, towards a uh, profitable conclusion. Right. Uh, what, what advice do you give to some of these CEOs in the clean tech space uh, going through, as you point out, sure. this difficult financing environment? And mm -hmm. uh, there, there are a lot of challenges. Any counsel? Yeah, absolutely. One is you have to get into the field. Right? If you want to minimize dilution and continue to attract investors, you have to minimize the risk of the journey. They love the story. The story works. It makes sense. But the risk is really getting out of the lab. Things that work in the lab don't necessarily get packaged. Packaging is a very difficult thing. And, and if you understand your science, sometimes you think packaging is the simple part. And then once you package, you have to go put it in these environments that are not controlled like a lab. So really, my advice is, is you have to figure out a way, look, for Series A and your funding and your seed money, prove it in the lab, prove your science. But you quickly have to show that you can package this and put it in a real world environment and commercialize it. Um, then they'll believe in you. And because their risk is the journey, it's not the story. Minimize that risk and you'll have some people following you. Well, great advice, and great counsel. Thank you so much for being here. And that concludes my discussion with David Mather. We'll be right back with more after this. The future is here. You can see it. It's At NRG, we're providing clean energy and now charging stations to make the electric car a reality. Kind of makes you want a boogie woogie, doesn't it? NRG, moving clean energy forward. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to the Energy Makers Show. Today we're visiting with Todd Staples, uh, head of Texas's Department of Agriculture. Commissioner, good to see you. Paul, it's good to see you. It's great to be with you today, and thank you for your leadership for Texas in this renewable energy front. Well, absolutely. Thank you for coming by. So tell us, uh, what's new at the Department of Agriculture? Well, I, I think uh, many people seem to forget these days that our grocery store shelves are not stocked by themselves. Uh, thanks to our state's farmers and ranchers, uh, Americans rely and have available the safest, most affordable, most reliable food supply in the world. I'd like to keep it that way. I think that's awfully important. And at the Department of Agriculture, our focus is to make certain that we have uh, an available domestic food supply, right. to make certain that uh, everyone understands that agriculture equals jobs. Uh, agriculture still represents about 9% of our entire gross state product. Uh, that translates to about $100 billion a year in terms of economic impact. Well, and one thing that I found interesting, you, uh, you and I serve on the Texas Bioenergy Policy Council, and, and as head of that council, it really is Texas investing in the future, thinking ahead about bioenergy. Can you tell our audience a little bit about that council? Absolutely. Uh, you know, uncertainty is the enemy of growth, and in the... Uh, early stages of renewable energy growth in Texas, we saw a lot of different ideas, some of them good, some of them better than sure. others. Uh, and we saw policymakers being approached with just uh, a lot of random ideas, and it didn't create uh, any focus that I believe that our Texas economy needs and that investors need. And so we started working with policymakers and industry stakeholders, um, Governor Perry's office and his staff to find a way that we could hopefully bring some, some focus to where we needed to be. And, and so the Bioenergy Policy Council kind of emerged from that and the legislature passed the legislation establishing it. I appreciate your service on it. I think we've got some really bright minds and forward thinkers about uh, how we can ensure that we have policies that guide us to where we need to be in Texas. And it's not just the, the small biofuels companies serving on this council, right? I mean, you've got some of the majors. Uh, we do, and, and that's the beauty of it. It represents the gamut of uh, bioenergy providers and ideas, I think. And I, and I think that means that every viewpoint gets represented. Uh, they, we may all start from different perspectives and different backgrounds and different ideas. 
But the goal is to have a successful Texas sure. and to have a place where uh, we can provide that certainty that is needed so desperately so that our economy can grow. Well, Texas is known, of course, for its traditional energy. How are these incumbents like Exxon and some of the others reacting uh, to this new bioenergy? You know, Texas is open for business. Um, Texans have long flourished because we've embraced technology, we've embraced innovation, and we've rewarded creativity and those that are willing to take risk. It's been re refreshing to me to see that uh, everyone from all perspectives understand that Texas has a strong history and energy over a century now of uh, success. Texans have had successful agricultural operations for well over a century. So we have the blueprint uh, to move forward. And, and even more than a blueprint, we really have a foundation in place. And in, anyone knows, before you launch any venture, it's essential you have a strong foundation. And so I think the incumbents recognize their opportunities, but, but they also recognize that what we have adopted at the Bioenergy Policy Council, uh, Council principles such as sustainability, equity, and having defensible policies need to be core to whatever we do. Well, and let's let's elaborate on that because you know, you talk about how uh, industry really needs that certainty. Tell tell me more about these policies. Well, the, the principles of sustainable, equitable, and defensible were really centered about around the thought process that we see a lot of different legislative initiatives that get floated around. And, and uh, sometimes they don't always pan out. And so when, it, when I say sustainable, I mean an industry that will be able to stand on its own two feet, not a flash in the pan, but something that's well thought out and has the ability to, to go the long haul. And we know that uh, sometimes policies uh, are, are not sustainable and they have adverse reactions and that's why sure. the sustainability is important. Equity is important because I firmly believe that government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers and we shouldn't use your taxpayer dollars to support something that's adverse to your industry or your business. So having that balance there of equity is important. Taxpayers want accountability with every dollar that they give, to, whether it's the school boards, our city council, state government, or federal government. And so we need to have policies that are defensible to the taxpayers. And I think these three criteria will be beneficial to us and sends the right message about who we are as Texans. Now, you've long been a great ambassador for the state of Texas, for our investor friends in, in Boston or New York or California, the venture capitalists, the private equity firms. Why should they be thinking about Texas for their portfolio companies? Texas has a powerful success story, and we've been blessed, and I'm very, uh, we all recognize that. But Success doesn't happen by chance. It comes through a thoughtful uh, strategy that we've had some consistent leadership in Texas. Uh, and we have the philosophy that uh, when we balance our budgets here in Texas, we do it without asking the taxpayers to pay more. Sure. I think having no personal income tax and not having a state income tax is an important part of saying that we are a safe haven for job growth and for capital investment in Texas. Uh, giving certainty in our regulatory approach, I, I think, also is very important. As an investor, you don't want the rules of the game to change after you've launched on a path because it changes the dynamics of your portfolio right. and, and the final bottom line that you have to show that return on investment to the investor. Uh, Texans understand that. Our business community understands it. Our legislature is a citizen legislature. Uh, and we have leaders that come from the business world and understand that those are principles. Now, before we wrap, did I hear that there there are future plans for Todd Staples? What, what What's coming up? Well, I'm excited about having the opportunity to serve. I've served in the Texas House and the Texas Senate, and I am a candidate for lieutenant governor in 2014. I, I think 2014 is a time for new leaders to step forward. Uh, Texas is going to have many changes, and it's kind of a, a turning point. The eyes of uh, my, my – I don't get to quote my Longhorn friends often and say the eyes of Texas are upon you, but I'll paraphrase and say the eyes of America are on Texas. Sure. And I want Texas to be a place where our children and our grandchildren can grow and prosper. Uh, we can make that happen 
by having a, a government that understands the private sector creates jobs, not government. Uh, serving in the legislature, being in business for over 20 years, this is what I understand and I look forward to serving Texans for many years. Well, fantastic. I thank you so much for coming by today. Paul, thank you. Good to be with you. And that wraps this week's episode of The Energy Makers, heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at TheEnergyMakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson and we'll see you next week.